My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. Hi, I'm Tark Barna and thanks for joining me today. There's a really interesting verse found in the Bible, actually in the Old Testament, which says, one will put a thousand to flight and two, 10,000. When I was at school, I always loved maths. Sometimes I was fortunate enough to get the top of the class. I remember once getting 99% in an exam. Pity I couldn't repeat that a lot more often. But so I'm reasonably good at maths. And my thinking is if one can put a thousand to flight and two, really should put 2,000 to flight because one is 1,000, two is 2,000. And yet this verse of Scripture says two is going to put 10,000 to flight. So that's a bit of a mysterious statement. I thought, what is that about? And so I've thought about it and explored it and looked into it to a certain extent over the years. And this is what I've discovered. What it is saying is that if you get one person on their own, they can accomplish so much. But if you get two people united together, I guess with one heart, one vision, one direction, the results don't just double, they increase exponentially. So one a thousand, two becomes not 2,000, not five, but 10,000. In some ways it's a real tease, isn't it? In the sense it's saying to you and me, if we can unite together with one other person or maybe even as a team, our success and our results are going to go through the roof. Isn't it interesting? that we live in a society today where unity and team breakdown or relationship breakdown is an epidemic, whether it's as teenagers or as kids, in marriages, in offices and staffs, any area where people are trying to work together, it almost seems like, gosh, this is just something we struggle to do and really battle to make it work out. In fact, what happens these days is when, t- when the going gets tough in any kind of relationship or team or staff setting, hey, let's split and go our separate ways instead of hanging in there together. In this message, I want to look at the incredible power of unity at any level, and the results are going to be fantastic. So please stay tuned. We only need to read the front page of the newspaper or watch the news on TV to appreciate just how much our land needs God's healing. Join Church Unlimited this coming March for the 2015 New Zealand and Beyond Conference with the theme Heal Our Land. With a tremendous lineup of speakers, including Russell Evans, Danny Gugliamucci, and Glenn Berto. For more information and to register, visit NewZealandandBeyond.com. If there's one area of church life and being a pastor and a minister or a church attender, where you really need to go the extra mile. I believe it's on the topic I want to share with you today. And that's talking about unity in the body of Christ. It's hard enough to have unity in your own home, you know, in your own church, let alone Unity among denominations and churches and the body of Christ, citywide, nationwide, worldwide, all that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty tall order. And uh, we'll never unite everyone, obviously, because everyone's too far apart. But what I'm talking about today is a heart and a spirit that we can have of unity and of loving all the body of Christ and everyone that is in it. So why go the extra mile for unity? Well, first and foremost is Jesus requires unity. He talks about it. Now, to be honest, if this wasn't something that Jesus required of us and that he prayed for, I think I would leave it in the too hard basket, where I actually is where I have left it most of my ministry time and uh, just sort of kept functioning in my own corner of the vineyard with the few people and the few churches that I get on well with. Well, actually, the one church I get on well with. (laughs) But you leave it in the too hard basket. But I can't do that because it's in the Bible. It's in red letters. Jesus himself speaks about it 
talks, it was important to Jesus among his last words that he gave his disciples. So if it's important to Jesus, then I think it needs to be important to me, to you, to all of us. In John 17, John pray, uh, Jesus prays for the disciples and for us. And he prays for complete unity. It's amazing. And one of the goals of his unity was to let the world know about him. Verse 21 says this, so the world may believe you have sent me. When we stand together, we begin to attract the world, the unbelievers. When we argue and separate and struggle and, you know, don't work together, we repel the world. And the Bible gives us only one example and one model, really, of how the world will know we are followers of Jesus Christ, and that's by our love for one another. Unity is a key to reaching New Zealand and beyond. It's a key to the Great Commission. So let's go to John 17, verse 20 to 23. It's up there now. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be, may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may, not, may believe that you sent me, that the world may believe, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, and they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, and they may be perfect and one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. If we want the world to know that God sent his son Jesus, one of the most important keys to that is when we have unity and a love for one another. Now, there's a huge difference between uniformity, everyone being the same, it's not what we're talking about, and unity, which is about a oneness of heart and a oneness of spirit. We're never ever gonna ever do all things together. Everyone's not gonna get together. There's just too many people, too much diversity, but there is a heart and a spirit that we are one with the same task to reach this world. In the 1890s, 1890s, there was a small Baptist church in Mayfield, Kentucky. There were two deacons. They were constantly fighting against one another. One Sunday, one deacon put a wooden peg in the back wall where the minister, the pastor, could hang his hat. The other deacon was furious when he saw it. He said, how dare anyone put a peg in the back wall without my permission? Well, the people in the church took sides. Those who were happy with the peg, those who were unhappy with the peg, this is a true story, and the church split in two. And now, hundreds of years later, the residents of Mayfield Baptist or Mayfield County, the people in that area, still refer to these two churches as Peg Baptist and Anti-Peg Baptist. <laughs> and we may laugh, but friends, we can go our separate ways over very minor issues. I read it about a while ago, I was in my research, but there was a church where they had this organ. And I don't know where the organ was placed, but the entire struggle in that church became over where should the organ be on the platform. Some of them wanted it at this place, some of them wanted it at the other place. That church split. And so they had their services at different times in the same building. So one could have the organ where they felt it should be, and the other could have the organ where they felt it should be. They divided over the organ. So I want a question I want to ask you. How big is your circle of people or ministers that you relate to? Does it include people who are different to you? Really different to you? I mean, my circle of friendships and ministers that I relate to include Joel Holm. <laughs> I mean, Joel is so different to me. You know, every time I have an idea, he gives me the opposite idea. And he just challenges my thinking all the time. But what I've discovered is this, is those who are different to us are often the ones who can benefit us the most. They're the ones that often we can receive more from than from anyone else. They're God sent and I need them. 
and you need other people as well. So I've got these Lego blocks here, and I'm not, we're not going to play Lego this morning, but you know, these Lego blocks, if you look at them closely, they have a, a, a protrusion out this side, and then a, a, an excess here, and then a lack here. Is that right? I used to think they were pretty poorly made because they look kind of funny. But the whole idea of these, how you can build something is you take the, the excess on this one and lock it into the lack in that one, and you start to build something that is solid and has structure. Now, if you try and just do it this way, you know, not using the protrusions and the lacks, nothing, you can't build this, it's just going to all fall apart. But when you do this, excess into lack, you build something of strength and beauty. And each and every one of you have excesses in areas of your life, in your ministry, where you're really good. But let me tell you, you also have real lacks in your life. And if you want to build something for the glory of God, you've got to find those people who have got the excess that's going to fit your lack. When you join together, you're going to build something of significance for the glory of God. So we all have lacks and we all have excesses. The world says to us, use your own, you know, fill the own, the, the lacks that you have, you fill it yourself. You sort it out yourself. You try and fill in that lack yourself. But the way God says, no, I've not made you to be independent. I've made you to be interdependent. I've made you to need one another. Can I say to you, there are ministers out there that if you were connecting with, would enhance your ministry tenfold or even more. There are churches out there, if you would connect with in unity, they would take the, the effectiveness of your church to a whole nother place. There's such power when we unite and join together. Now, God did a real number on me in unity that I, you know, I never imagined I would be the person preaching on unity in the body. Some of you are probably looking at me and say, you preaching this? <laughs> hey, I know a lot about you and I know your history and you, you got no authority to preach this message and you're probably right. I haven't, I've been uh, independent. I mean, that's just the way I've done it for years. My own vineyard and just got on with the job, but God really did a number on me just about three, four, six months ago. I don't know exactly when it was. And this is what happened. <clears throat> Who's interested tonight? <clears throat> Changed my whole walk with God. I was reading about the great reformers in a book. Ones that moved the church forward in quantum leaps. But one of the problems was this, that many of them didn't always confront differences in love. And it seems to me that the Reformation actually opened a huge door to a spirit of division. Keep listening. Luther, for example, is remembered as one of the greatest men of faith, restored justification by faith, restored, uh, fought against idolatry and against indulgences. Yet, did you know, at the same time, Luther had Anabaptists put to death because they disagreed with him. The greatest, one of the greatest reformers of all time, when it came to differences within the body, it wasn't done in love and there came a separation of ways. Now, I want to suggest this. In the genetics of the church, there is a tendency to split and schism over minor doctrinal and other differences. It's in the heart. It's in, almost in the DNA. Keep listening. Because what happened is after the reformers broke away from the church, there were countless other movements that followed the precedent and they broke away from the reformers because they keep coming these little subtle differences that they, that they all disagreed on. And there came a, a mindset in the body of Christ that if the going get gets tough, run, disappear, you know, split, divide, go your separate ways. It's just a kind of a mindset that has established. And so a minor church problem today, it can lead to splits. And so what do you have now around the world? You have tens of thousands of denominations all across the globe. And I reckon the world must look on and think, wow, that's interesting. How come they're all so different and so separated? Now, I'm not saying 
There's never a valid reason for new denominations because many have been raised up by God, been needed to bring in new truth. Luther needed to break away and bring in the Great Reformation. But the way it was done, I think, sowed a seed that really does hinder unity. And you know, pastors, don't we suffer with that today? Something that someone in the church doesn't agree with, what do they do? Run. Church down the road. The pain, the hurt is so much. And what you think, why are you going over such a minor issue? Friends, it's in the genetics. And it goes right into society. If marriage gets tough, run. If your job's too hard, run. If the friendship gets difficult, run. Just, just get out of it. It's, it's just, it's like a plague. And it's also, unfortunately, within the church. Some people like the sound loud. Some people like it quiet. And some people are going to split over the difference. You'll lose people because it's, you know, it's just so easy, isn't it, to distance ourselves from people who don't, think, who don't see things our way. And it's easy to do, isn't it? As if we know we are right. Huh? Well, just maybe sometimes we should say, maybe you're right and I'm wrong. Satan's strategy has always been the same. What is it? Divide and conquer. What's God's strategy? Unite and conquer. If we will unite together, friends, we can conquer the world for Jesus. <laughs> Here's the second reason to pursue unity. The first one was because Jesus said to. That, that's enough of a reason, isn't it? Yeah. It's enough. But often what Jesus said is not enough for us, and we need more. <clears throat> There's great power in unity. I want you to come with me to Proverbs chapter 30 because it talks about four things that are small yet are extremely wise. Extremely wise. So if you've got a Bible, if you haven't, just look on the screen. Proverbs 30 verse 24, it talks about the locust. Proverbs 30 verse 24. This is what it says. It says, there are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Everyone say exceedingly wise. Yeah, keep listening because you want, how many of you want to be exceedingly wise? All right, here it is, you're going to find out. Let's go to verse uh, 27, verse 24, verse 27. The locusts have no king, yet they advance in ranks. In other words, they advance together in unity. Now, if you look at a locust, it's a pretty harmless looking fellow. I mean, not unless you swallow it, you probably might think, gosh, he's going to kill me. But one locust, how much damage can one locust do? How much can it eat? Not a lot. But what if these locusts, we're talking about extreme wisdom here. What if these locusts join together as an army, united as one? Come with me to Exodus chapter 10. Let's see what can happen. Exodus 10, verse 12 and 15. says, <clears throat> verse 12, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. Verse 15, For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, so there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. When the locusts unite together as one, they can cause incredible devastation across the landscape of a nation. 
I want to suggest if the body of Christ can begin to come together as one, we will cause incredible devastation for in the sense, of, in the right sense, across the landscape of our nation. We can change the landscape if we will unite together as one. If we will take our excesses and put it into our lacks and join together, we can be a destructive force for the glory of God. But as long as we think we can do it on our own in our little corner or a few of us banding together, friends, it's not going to happen. We got to join together. You can't join with everyone, but there will be divine connections God wants to give you. God says this unity of the locust is a lesson for us in extreme wisdom. But it's going to require you going a few extra miles to walk in this kind of unity because it's just not easy. We'll look at that in a moment. Psalm 133 says, <clears throat> have you ever thought of this one? Where there is unity, God commands a blessing, even life forevermore. You may have heard that a lot of times, but did you pick up the last few words? Commands a blessing, even life forevermore, salvation of the nations, life, eternal life. God commands, yeah, not just to bless me and we get touched by God, ministry, all, that's all fantastic. We see the power of God, people get healed. But friends, it's more than that. God commands a blessing, even life, eternal life forevermore for multitudes. I believe unity is a key to a revival and an outbreak of multitudes being saved and stepped into the kingdom of God. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. United together. Heaven opened up, did it not? Yeah. Multitudes were saved. And that changed the landscape, not of just a nation, but nations. That's, That's the vision of New Zealand and beyond. We want to help change the landscape, not just of New Zealand, but of the nations of the world. Next time on Running With Fire. Isaiah 65 verse 8 says, New wine is found in the cluster. Get that? not in the single grape. You see, we don't have it all, friends. We need the cluster. We need one another. We need the body. They can add to us so much and make us that much more rich and effective. To walk worthy of our calling, your calling, my calling, is includes walking or endeavoring to walk in unity with others in the body of Christ. So when we're for unity, and working towards unity, we are walking worthy of the great calling that Jesus has given to us. And that takes a level of humil humility beyond our natural ability. Where is the devil going to work the most separation? Where he knows the unity of the two together is going to be powerful. So he doesn't care. He's not going to be bothering about separating you from people that don't really matter. But when there's relationships that are key for your future, when there are other churches that are key for your future, He's going to work overtime. He said, I've got to split this combination here because they're going to cause devastation across the landscape of their community. I want to suggest that some of the people that you're divided from are the very people you need to help you move into all that God has got for you. And as leaders, we've got to diligently encourage unity among churches. And you've got a lot of power to do that from the pulpit. I want to encourage you, speak well of other churches publicly. Speak well of other ministers publicly, even those who are different from you. Say, man, they're doing a fantastic job in our nation. Speak well of them. It'll change the Because what I've discovered is the people in the church actually don't have much problem with unity in the body. They love it. It's us. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> the leaders, we have the problem often. But we can change that. But what is true is this, we can kill our fellowship with other believers of a very small differences that make no difference to the Great Commission and reaching the world for Jesus Christ. Make no difference. We're all on the same side. Isn't it amazing how, being honest with you, sometimes God will take your weakness and make it your strength. My weakness is I'm in my own corner doing my thing. And God's turning that all around and saying, no, no longer, Tark. Work with the body. 
Friends, it's not too late for us to join hands and work together and see that the world may know that God has sent His Son. Let's join our hands together and we will get the job done. Well, as I mentioned in that message, God really did a number on me in the whole area of unity. I had really put it in the too hard basket. You know, getting churches and Christians to unite was just off the scale, as it were, and I wasn't even going to try. But since God dealt with me, I really worked harder in this area. And it's always quite in my mind to do what I can to support unity and to bring churches together. It's been a journey for me. And I really trust I've made some progress. And actually, I would like to be a champion for unity in the body of Christ. And that's a big call, and I'm going to need God to help me. But I do think it's worth pursuing. I remember traveling to a nation in Asia a number of years ago. Went to an ch- area, and there was about, I don't, can't remember, maybe 15 churches of a certain denomination. Had a good time there. Went back a year or two later, and amazingly, the number of churches has doubled, so it was maybe 30 or 40. I can't remember the exact number. I was talking to the leaders in that area. I said, this is fantastic. You know, God is really at work in your area. Until they informed me that what had happened, it had been multiplication by division. So they couldn't get on together. So all these churches split. There were no more Christians attending the church. There was just double the numbers. And I thought, wow, what an example of the struggle for us as Christians and churches to stay united and work together. Remember what we said earlier, one will put a thousand to flight, two, 10,000. So division really works against progress and success. I want to challenge you with three things that you could do in the whole area of unity. Number one, why don't you think about on a regular basis praying for unity, unity in your own relationships, unity in your church, unity among churches. That would be a great thing to do. Number two, never be the source of disunity. I often say this to people in my church. You know, if you're really struggling, hey, don't be the cause of disunity. You know, do whatever you have to, but don't be sort of the one that's the champion that's actually leading the way in disunity. And so the third thing you can do is why don't you become a champion of unity? Why don't you do everything you can to develop unity in your relationships, in your church, or even among churches. Hey, I'd love to hear from you personally. Why don't you take a few moments to contact us via the website on the screen, send us your feedback, or send us a testimony. And join me again next week. Thanks for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests, stream online TV and radio episodes, and view blog articles. You can also connect with Tarkbana through Twitter for regular updates. Church Unlimited meets at two locations in Auckland, New Zealand. You're welcome to come along for a visit.